Welcome back Earth Scientist and now we're going to talk about tides overview. So we've looked at the ocean floors and we're going to talk about the impacts of tides. Tides are different from waves and you're looking at sea stacks right here and this area that you see on the beach line is impacted daily by a high tide and a low tide condition. This is actually on the coastline of Oregon. So what are tides and why do we care? They are systematic and have rhythm rises and falls of sea levels that occur naturally because of the gravitational pull of the earth to the moon and the sun for that matter. Literally, these are very long and regular shallow water waves. Sometimes they can have a little bit of power behind them and we'll look at one case in particular but they are caused by that gravitational attraction of the sun, the moon, and the earth. And the moon in particular create, creates a much stronger tide than the gravitational pull that we have to the sun. So lunar tidal bulges are small horizontal forces that push seawater into two types of bulges. One bulges faces the sun and one, uh, or should, the moon, excuse me, and one bulge uh, faces the opposite side of the Earth over here. The bulge that's closest to the Moon is always going to be more significant than that's on the other side of the Earth. When the Moon is closer to the Earth, lunar tide produces force greater than that of our Sun and you'll have two tidal bulges, two high tides, 12 hours apart when these things occur. The high tide is the flood tide where sea water actually moves on to shoreline or what is considered dry land and at low tide we refer to that as an ebbing or ebb tide. Uh, ebb and flow, you probably heard that term, well that comes from tidal terminology and that's where sea water moves offshore back towards the ocean. So while we've learned about transgressions and regressions, this, that's a long term change in sea level. This is a daily uh, change change in sea level, so they're like miniature transgressions and regressions that happen on a daily basis. When you have a tidal bulge caused by the sun, a solar one, they're similar to lunar bulges but much more small because the earth is not being uh, pulled as much by that process. So what happens is when we have um, moon situations, either a full moon or a new moon, the moon's in between us and the sun and we get pulled on with an exceptional amount of tide pull there. But when we're at third quarter and first quarter moon, the moon isn't in between us and the sun and so we get a much uh, smaller amount of pull from the sun on those same areas. So we call that uh, spring versus neap tide. New and full moon produces spring tide and then quarter moons like third quarter and first quarter where the moon's not in the way in between us and the sun, that is a neap tide. How long does it take between each of these tidal patterns to occur? It takes a tidal month, uh, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So the monthly tidal cycle for spring tide actually happens when you get your cycles of full moon and new moon. So during new and full moons, the gravitational forces added together produce extremely high and extremely low tides. Now let me tell you why that can be important. Certain areas of the globe can actually have significant high tides that weren't the same from the day before. When I was in Alaska, there was an area on one of our tours, they were pointing out that uh, a man or several people actually had been stuck where they were doing fishing along the coast and got stuck in the muds as the spring tides came in at their most intensive uh, portions at a full moon. And they got stuck in the muds and nobody was around to help and they drowned. So this is stuff that you wanna be very careful about when you're in areas that experience dramatic tidal changes and certainly the case with the spring tide. For a neap tide, this is gonna be where the moon is not in between us and the sun and it'll be at third quarter and first quarter stages of the moon. And the forces are offset between uh, the moon, the earth and the sun and the tidal range is very minute. It's the smallest tide that you're gonna have. That's called NEAP, N-E-A-P, that's a NEAP tide. So how long does it take for a lunar day to occur? 
24 hours and 50 minutes for a person to see subsequent moons directly overhead and high tides are 12 hours and 25 minutes apart. You're wondering, how did people figure this out? Well, they measured the tides and we were able to figure out that there's a systematic uh, rolling in of water and rolling back out. So if you could imagine maybe two or 3,000 millenniums ago, humans were trying to figure out what was happening with the water who knows what their answer was for high and low tide causes. Another complementing factor is declination. Uh, this is the angular distance of the moon or the sun above or below the Earth's equator and that impacts tides and how you're going to have tides, what types of size tides you're going to have. When the sun to the Earth is at 23.5 degrees north or south at the equator while the moon to the Earth is 28.5 north or south degrees uh, of the equator. That shifts lunar and solar bulges from the equator calling, causing unequal tides depending on what latitude that you exist in. So declination plays a role in how tides impact different areas of the globe. Elliptical orbits of our planet also impact tidal situations. Now, tidal range will be greatest at perihelion and that happens in January. So that is going to occur at perigee, and perigee is when the moon is closest to the Earth. The tidal range is least at aphelion in July, and, a, and the moon version of that is a pogee. A pogee is when the moon is farthest away from the Earth. So that's perihelion and aphelion have to do with how close the Earth and how far away the Earth is from the sun. So the equivalents of that for the Earth and the moon are perigee and apogee. A perigee and apogee cycle is 27.5 days, which is a syndotic month. So what are tidal patterns? There's diurnal, uh, semi-diurnal, mixed. A diurnal is characterized by one high and one low tide per day. And you can actually see that in areas that have diurnal tidal patterns. Semi-diurnal means obviously there's two highs, two lows every tidal day. A mixed is where you could get two highs and two low waters each day or varying water heights and uh, you're gonna, just gonna get a mixture of how those tides operate. So that's gonna be dictated by where you're located in latitude, it's gonna be dictated by the time of year, it's gonna be dictated by a pogey, perigee, all of those things that we just learned about. Semi-diurnal tidal patterns, when they do have two highs and two low tides each day, there's little difference between the high and the low tide water heights. These are common along the shorelines of the United States where we have semi-diurnal systems. Mixed tidal patterns, you usually have uh, a very unusual difference between high, wide or high, uh, high water heights and low water heights or both. The place you can see this most distinctively is along the Pacific coastline of the United States. You can see it in Alaska as well. Tidal frequencies for North America are interesting because they don't follow a rhyme or a reason. I want you to look at this diagram and notice that this is showing you uh, how the tide comes in and out for each area or dramatically in terms of location. And I want you to notice there's one area that is, should stand out to you as substantially different from the rest. And it's this area, the Bay of Fundy. So let's take a look at the Bay of Fundy. What's up with that? Tide waves are reflected by the coastline of Nova Scotia and that amplifies the amount of tides that can come in. The tidal range for the Bay of Fundy is 56 feet. That's incredible. So let's show you what that looks like in terms of images. This is high tide in the Bay of Fundy along the Nova Scotia coast. So notice that the boats are at harbor, they're parked in their locations and their slots. This is what it looks like at low tide. Same exact location. Wow, isn't that incredible in the same day. So you're not talking about, you know, at a different season. We're talking about this is the extreme change day in and day out in this particular area. So if I had to point you to a location where this is one of the most extreme tidal uh, variances in the Northern Hemisphere, it would be the Bay of Fundy. So what is a tidal bore? Remember I said earlier there's a circumstance by which waters uh, kind of come in at an unusual uh, pace. They're pretty strong. 
That's what a tidal bore is. This occurs when the leading edge of an incoming tide forms a distinctive visible standing wave like you see right here that travels upstream into a river basin on into land. These can actually be fairly dangerous <laughs> if you're not prepared for them. And they flow against the normal flow of the currents of the rivers or a narrow bay that flow back out into the ocean. So this can be, uh, remarkably change where uh, the water edge is for a freshwater system in an estuary, a lagoon, or something like that. So if you had shoreline property along an edge of, so let's say, the Bay of Fundy, you would need to be a super distance away from the normal coastline for tides and take into account what it looks like at extreme tide conditions before you build your structure. So tidal currents, these are the horizontal flow accompanying the rise and fall of tides and flood currents advance into the coastal zone and ebb currents move the water back out to sea. Sometimes they create structures of sedimentation where that water kind of loses its velocity and drops out sediment just like a river will do as it floods back into the ocean and stops and kind of fans out and the energy dissipates, the sediments drop in its place, creating deltas. So deltaic deposits from tides can actually occur and are very common in shoreline areas that have uh, multiple tides a day or extreme tide conditions. So what would you see features associated with tidal currents? You can actually see barrier islands that can be made by tidal currents. You can see tidal deltas, just like I pointed out. And then you can see tidal flats. Well, tidal flats are uh, a form of a marshland or of a swampy-like condition and provides special habitat for uh, animals that rely on it. So we're gonna wrap this one up with tides and I'll see you at the next lecture, but I'm gonna give you a few minutes to uh, regroup. It's a nice short lecture for you, you're like, yay! And I wanna leave you with this thought. Look at this structure right here. And I want you to figure out what's on top. Look at it really closely, zoom in with your computer and you're looking for these things right up here. What's up with them? And what are they and why are they sitting on this? That's gonna be part of your next lesson and I'll see you for Shorelines shortly. Bye.